The popular carol, In the Bleak Midwinter, asks and answers the question of a believer in Jesus. What can I give him, poor as I am? What can I give him, give my heart? Asking questions and then answering them is a useful literary technique. Why? Because it gets us, as readers or listeners, to think about our own response, to put ourselves in the shoes of the questioner, and we're encouraged to think about the question for ourselves. When we get to the answer, the writer or the speaker's hope is that we'll want to echo it, adding our own amen. One of the most famous examples in the Bible is in Romans 8. The Apostle Paul has spent several chapters of his letter expounding the wonderful grace of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Forgiveness of sins for all who believe, justification, sanctification, glorification, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then, in verse 31, he asks, what then shall we say to these things? The question is half rhetorical. Paul's answer follows immediately. And actually, it takes the form of six more questions, such as, if God is for us, who can be against us? All six of these questions have the answer, no, or no one, or he won't. You can just imagine Paul preaching this section of Romans. He ends this justly famous portion of scripture by expressing his firm conviction as the cumulative result of his question and answer reflections. I am sure that neither life nor death, nor angels or rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the final verse of the carol, In the Bleak Midwinter, the English poet Christina Rossetti, who lived in the 19th century, also employs the question and answer technique. The emphasis in the carol is first on the cold and dark and hostile world into which Jesus came at Christmas, and second on the humility with which he came, despite his divinity and lordship. Jesus enjoyed the worship of angels in heaven, yet he was born in a stable place, content to drink his mother's milk and to lie in a manger. In this way, Rossetti asks us to focus on the wonder and mystery of the Incarnation. Crucial to Rossetti's take on the Christmas story is that each character has an important role in the scene she imagines. Of course, the story reflects real events, yet it is an imaginary scene in the poetic sense that it's a composite of different biblical stories, shepherds, wise men, and of course, the suggestion that it takes place in winter. Indeed, every character has something valuable to contribute. Jesus' mother Mary, besides giving her milk, worships him with a kiss. Shepherds, rushing in from the surrounding hills, bring their lambs. Wise men, travellers from far away, do their part. Even ox and ass and camel are said to adore the infant Jesus. And that just leaves us. In the final verse, Rossetti draws us into the holy scene and invites us to consider our response. Jesus Christ is born for us. What then shall we say to these things? More than that, what shall we give him, poor as we are? Now, is this talk of poverty just poetic sentimentalism? Surely not, if we dwell for a moment on what's going on here. In the face of the event of God incarnate, Jesus Christ entering our world, we have nothing to contribute. These things happened in the bleak midwinter long ago. God stooped low to save, not because of anything we did or would do, but because of his amazing grace. To paraphrase Paul, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ was born for us, for he was born with his saving death in view. Yes, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. That's Galatians 4. We have nothing to contribute to this grace, and if we're spiritually awake, we'll be conscious only of our poverty before God. And yet, as Rossetti acknowledges, there is something I can give Jesus in response. My heart. This is not a gift that buys me any favour with him. Always in the gospel, we love because he first loved us. Yet Jesus desires my heart. In John 4, 23, Jesus says that the Father is seeking true worshippers. That's a truly amazing thought. The Father wants us to worship him. He doesn't need us. And yet he desires our heart worship. 
Likewise, as we read the Gospels, we see that Jesus himself seeks our hearts. He desires that we should understand with our hearts, turn to him for his healing. He wants our hearts to be close to him, not to doubt in our hearts, but to love God with all our hearts. His will is that our hearts should not be troubled or filled with sorrow, but that our hearts may rejoice in knowing him in his resurrection. Our hearts are safe in his care. What then shall we say to these things? What can I give him, poor as I am? What can I give him? Give my heart.